Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. So, a little bit of context before I get started here. This was for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon. So, the June prompt was something like uh, read reread a book that you hated. And I always used to say, Mrs. Dalloway was my most hated book of all time. I had to read it for university when we did a London in Literature module, and so we had this set of required reading. And to be honest, I don't think it helped that some of the other books on that list, for example, that's when I discovered Sherlock Holmes, and then Mrs. Dalloway, I think, was the week afterwards. So I think that's part of the reason why I struggled with it. I never, it was the only book for that entire module I didn't manage to physically read, and I actually had to break my rule, because my rule is basically I can listen to audiobooks for rereads, but for first time reads, I prefer to read the physical copy. So. This is the only book I've ever read where I had to break that rule and listen to it on audiobook first. That's pretty much why I went into this. I listened to this on audiobook again. I listened to it with Becca as well. She listened with me. And I'm going to read you the blurb. And then what I'm going to do, this is slightly different. I haven't been able to tab through it because obviously it was an audiobook. So I've written some notes down on my computer. And I do have one section I'd like to read to you as well. But um, yeah, let's go through it. So, Virginia Woolf, Mrs. Dalloway, the Wordsworth Classics Edition. With an introduction and notes by Mary M. Pavlovsky, Professor and Chair, Department of English, California State University, Bakersfield. Didn't, didn't read that because that wasn't part of the audiobook. Virginia Woolf's singular technique in Mrs. Dalloway heralds a break with the traditional novel form and reflects a genuine humanity and a concern with the experiences that both enrich and stultify existence. Society hostess Clarissa Dalloway is giving a party. That's missing a comma there. Like, it, it says, society hostess, comma, Clarissa Dalloway is giving a party. Shouldn't it be society hostess, comma, Clarissa Dalloway, comma, is giving a party? Anyway. Her thoughts and sensations on that one day, and the interior monologues of others whose lives are interwoven with hers, gradually, there should be another comma there, gradually reveal the characters of the central protagonists. Clarissa's life is touched by tragedy as the events in her day run parallel to those of Septimus Warren Smith, whose madness escalates as his life draws towards inevitable suicide. Which happens right at the end, by the way. Spoiler alert. The delicate artistry and lyrical prose of Wolf's fourth novel have established her as a writer of profound talent. I don't know, I'm kind of annoyed. Maybe it may be that this edition is actually part of the reason why I didn't like it. Because that blurb has just annoyed me. But anyway, right, so... A little bit of a spoiler towards my rating, what I, what I gave this book. I did not think this was anywhere near as bad as I remembered it being. In fact, I kind of enjoyed it. Now, it possibly helped that before starting the audiobook, I got a little bit drunk. Not because of that, just for different reasons. So, um, so the first disc of it, I listened to while slightly inebriated. I like the fact the audio version was actually narrated by somebody called Virginia. And um, she had a very posh voice. Let me see if I can get part of her audiobook up so that you can see what she sounded like. Becca didn't like the audiobook because she didn't like the narrator. But I actually thought the narrator added a lot to it. Because she sounded like what I imagine Virginia Woolf probably sounded like. Love and religion, thought Clarissa, going back into the drawing room, tingling all over. How detestable, how detestable they are. It's been compared to Ulysses, which Wolf apparently read reluctantly, which I thought was funny because I read her book reluctantly twice. Uh, technically three times. It's really beautifully written and there are some great quotes in it. One of them that I wrote down here was just the line, I prefer men to cauliflowers. Excellent. I wrote, so my notes I put, it's actually all right, not as bad as I remembered. We have some, again, this is a great quote to show the kind of the beauty of the language. So a little bit of alliteration here. So just the phrase, brass bands, barrel organs. And I do think it was a good choice for London in literature. It really did a good job of establishing London, you know, as a place. It's almost like a very long prose poem and it's very stream of consciousness. But again, I just enjoyed a lot of the language. There are some weird bits. Another thing was the line, for the cook, who was Irish and whistled all day long. Is that what Irish people do? What else have we got? So character wise, I do find it quite jarring when it goes between Dalloway and Septimus Smith, who is the other character in this, or the other main character. It's weird how there are like two protagonists, really. It's quite an innovative approach to it. Unfortunately for me, 
I just don't like Mrs. Dalloway as the character. She is boring. So Septimus Smith is great. Uh, I mean, he, it's a portrayal of being shell-shocked. I mean, it's PTSD, but they didn't really have a name for it at the time. It's not own voices or anything like that, but Wolf obviously did have her own demons. I mean, she eventually killed herself, which I will talk about in a little bit. But um, I think she did a really good job of portraying it, especially for the time period. I mean, I think this was written in the 20s. And, uh, you know, there's a bit where he wants to tell the Prime Minister that the trees are plotting against him, which... I don't know. I thought that was I thought it was really well handled. At the same time, I don't know if that's how somebody with like shell shock and PTSD would actually think. It sounds more like paranoid schizophrenia to me, but yeah, it would have been a much more interesting book for me if it had only followed Septimus. But hey ho. It's also a great reminder that intergenerational differences aren't like a new thing. There's a lot of that in this book, and this was in like 1920s of the old looking down on the young and stuff. And so I thought that actually made it quite relatable. There was a quote in it where she she went, Oh, women's rights, that antediluvian topic. Hey Google, what does antediluvian mean? Here's the definition of antediluvian. Of a belonging to the time before the biblical flood. So women's rights belongs to the time before the biblical flood. I don't know, I'm not convinced that women's rights are particularly evidenced in the Old Testament. I don't know. I would I would hesitate to make that comparison. I, I would say that, I mean, women's rights, if anything, they're more like a 21st century topic. Another great quote was, uh, she evolved this atheist religion of doing good for the sake of goodness, which I like because I am an atheist. I like to consider myself a good person. I try to do things that are good for other people and generally for the world, to be honest. I mean, I've recently become vegan, for example, because I don't want any part in the way that animals are treated, for, even for the sake of, you know, milk and stuff like that. Another quote, she said something was a much pleasanter thing, which really bugged me because I think it should be a more pleasant thing, but whatever. There was a point where she was looking at a little girl with a muff, and I appreciate that a muff is a slightly different thing back then. There was a character in it called Dr. Holmes, who obviously just kept putting me in mind of Sherlock Holmes. And I would have read this the week after I first read The Sign of the Four, which was my first ever Sherlock Holmes read as well. So that probably bugged me quite a lot of the time. I'm going to read you this long old quote, just to give you a sense of the writing style. And because I think Peter Walsh sounds a little bit like me. It was odd. It was true. Lots of people felt it. Peter Walsh, who had done just respectably, filled the usual posts adequately, was liked, but thought a little cranky, gave himself airs. It was odd that he should have had, especially now that his hair was grey, a contented look, a look of having reserves. It was this that made him attractive to women who liked the sense that he was not altogether manly. There was something unusual about him, or something behind him. It might be that he was bookish, never came to see you without taking up the book on the table. He was now reading, with his bootlaces trailing on the floor. Or that he was a gentleman which showed itself in the way he knocked the ashes out of his pipe, and in his manners of course to women. For it was very charming and quite ridiculous how easily some girl without a grain of sense could twist him round her finger, but at her own risk. That is to say, though he might be ever so easy, and indeed with his gaiety and good breeding fascinating to be with, it was only up to a point. She said something. No, no, he saw through that. He wouldn't stand that. No, no. Then he could shout and rock and hold his sides together over some joke with men. He was the best judge of cooking in India. He was a man, but not like this, but not the sort of man one had to respect, which was a mercy. Not like Major Simmons, for instance. Not in the least like that, Daisy thought, when, in spite of her two small children, she used to compare them. Another quote I wanted to read out here, which I think this tells you everything you need to know about bloody why middle class, well upper class I suppose, men. She accused Hugh Whitbread, of all people, and there he was, her old friend Hugh, talking to the Portuguese ambassador, of kissing her in the smoking room to punish her for saying that women should have votes. Vulgar men did, she said, and Clarissa remembered having to persuade her not to denounce him at family prayers, which she was capable of doing with her daring, her recklessness, her melodramatic lover being the centre of everything and creating scenes, and it was bound, Clarissa used to think, to end in some awful tragedy, her death, her martyrdom, instead of which she had married, quite unexpectedly, a bald man with a large buttonhole who owned, it was said, cotton mills at Manchester. And she had five boys! Wait. So she's causing a scene if she tells people that Hugh Whitbread kissed her to punish her for saying that women should have votes. 
Then Dalloway gets annoyed because Septimus kills himself at her party and she's like, oh, he's ruined my party. It's, it's interesting though because Wolf actually killed herself too. So I, I think I got this from Wikipedia because I think the detail of how she did it is worth noting as well. On the 28th of March, 1941, Wolf drowned herself by filling her overcoat pockets with stones and walking into the River Ouse near her home. I mean, that is an insane way to kill yourself. That is insane. Who does that? That's about all I have got to say about Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf. What I will say again, it's nowhere near as bad as I remembered. It's actually put me in the mood to read some more Wolf, and I probably will. She's actually got a book in my Vintage Mini Moderns over there, which Becky got me for my birthday. So I look forward to that. I only give this a 3.5 out of 5. And I am very glad that I reread it. So, yay. This makes up for the fact that I reread Sherlock Holmes and didn't enjoy it as much. Uh, to be fair, I, I explain why in my review for that. I'm running out of filming time on my camera, so I'm not going to go into that. But yeah, pretty good. So on that note, thanks a lot for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read Mrs. Dalloway and or if you've read any Virginia Woolf. And uh, yes, sorry, I just choked on my own spit a bit. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.